What's up, my name is Robin, and today we are turning this into this. We are turning this into this, and we're doing it using some advanced techniques inside the Blender compositor. And at the end, we save that compositor as the default start file, so that the next time you open a new project, you can get a look of final polish right from the get-go. And the file I'm working on together with you now is this one, which you're going to say is super boring. And you're gonna say, Robin, how could you possibly rescue that? Watch me. All right, glasses on means that we're in business. So we're working on this file right here. And in order to get that into the compositing tab, we need to render it just once. Now, if, if you already have an image that you want to work on, say, for example, you have something like this image here, then you can just drag that file into the compositor and you don't need to render anything. And, and, and it works that way. But let me just render this for you so you'll see the most common type of workflow. Okay, now that it's rendered, we can go to the compositing tab, control shift left click on this to make a viewer, and I'm gonna be real with you. I do not enjoy the default Blender compositor. Like this, this thing, it's a, it's a neat idea to have it in the background, but <laughs> I don't like it and you don't either. So let's turn off that backdrop and open a new window, which we'll set to uh, image viewer. Where is that? Uh, they've hidden it there. And in this drop down, we'll just search for viewer node. And that gives us that, uh, that viewer preview in a separate window. But the default Blender compositor, at least in this version of Blender, runs on the CPU. It's gonna be very, very slow. Let me demonstrate that for you. Let's mute that and unmute it. And you'll see it takes a second, but the viewport compositor doesn't. So I like to have two versions of this window open. One is the 3D viewport with all the overlays turned off, rendered view on and compositor turned on in the camera. And this one, when I mute it and unmute it, it's instant, while the other one isn't. And by the way, this also does work if you drag in an image, like for example, this image here. If you pull that into here, then this is also going to show in the 3D viewport. However, it's gonna be big because of um, the 3D viewport actually working in, in screen space. Uh, and so I like to have a transform node at the end here and scale that down just to be able to work with it. And this is muted by default, but I like to have that there in my default file if I wanna drag in uh, an image, but let's not do that for now. And let's actually start with compositing. Now, the first step in my compositing workflow is to add a knee and that's done using an RGB curves node set to film like because sometimes you work in scenes in Blender that have extreme light values that are just <laughs> they're impossible to work with and the Blender compositor kind of it doesn't work well with extreme values. So a, a little known trick that you can do with the RGB curves is you can go to this mask button here and you can turn up uh, the because uh, this value here is zero and this is one we want to uh, adjust values above one and you can do that in the mask icon turning up both of these to say let's let's work with things above five and then in the arrow you just reset the view and it'll show you those values going all the way up to five hold on let's reset the curve as well just to just to show that uh, we'll add one uh, one dot at one one. So we want to protect those those uh, values at at white. And let's just pull this one down a little bit. But what what we want is out of this. This is called a knee. That's the technique we're we're doing now. We want this to go out kind of horizontal, coming out of this curve. So what we really want is like this kind of shape. And we do want to protect the straight line going from zero to one. So to do that more effectively, let's also add one dot at point two, two. These are X, Y coordinates. And just try to make this kind of horizontal, not quite, and keep this line going out of it. 
on that perfect diagonal. This is the kind of shape we're after. And if I mute this and unmute it, we're not supposed to see a huge difference, not in a regular scene like this. And that's good. We've just prepared our image for compositing. With this workflow, we simulate how a real camera works, and we do it in three steps. The first one is we simulate a lens, then we simulate film that the light is hitting, and then we do some grading afterwards. And that's the three-step process, and we're gonna start with a lens. Now, no lens is perfect, so let's add a filter, soften, and that'll just soften up the image just ever so slightly. If I mute that, you'll see on the right, perfect uh, digital line, and then just a little soft. I usually keep this down at 0.5 to 0.2, something like this. And then we can add a, what's called a low pass filter. Now, Blender doesn't have a built-in low pass filter, but it's very easy to make. We just do a blur, and then we mix the blur over this one. Actually, before I start using hotkeys, Let's, you're, you're gonna appreciate this. Let's go into here and turn on screencast keys. And then you can see everything I'm doing over here. So let's try that again. We'll do blur, control shift, right click, and that mixes those together. And, and this blur node uh, is inconsistent between images because it works on pixel values. So if I turn this up, you'll see it blurs a lot more on the left than on the right. But if we set it to relative and turn on an aspect correction, doesn't matter which one, then it's going to look the same uh, no matter what image you're viewing on. And so what kind of radius do we want for this? This, this simulates kind of a dew on the lens, like condensation. Uh, something like this, I think, and then turn down the mix factor, and that'll just add this kind of haziness to the whole image. And we want to keep this quite low, like, to, to, for you to be able to view this on YouTube, I, I'll turn this up just like this so you'll see what it actually does. It does this, but for me, I like to keep this around 0.1, something like that, very subtle, because we'll be stacking a lot of effects, and if we go overboard with any of them, the, it'll break the image at the end. So let's group these and call it a low pass, and then move over to a lens distortion. The lens distortion node, uh, I just want to use that to add some chromatic aberrations to the end. We're doing this. Uh, 0.01 is usually a good starting point, and since that does warp the image a bit, we might introduce some, some black edges, at least if we turn up distortion as well. Every lens has some distortion, and um, e even the most expensive ones. The more expensive you go, the less distortion there is, but it does add realism. Uh, but we get these black, uh, these black corners, so let's do a fit to zoom that in to get rid of those black corners as well. Then we can do a glare, because a lot of lenses do have a kind of glare. I like the lenses that have a kind of star glare. Uh, the, that's, that, it's, it's a bit cheesy, I know, but I like that. So I'll set it to high, turn up iterations, this is uh, the quality. Turn up to a bunch of streaks, like 16. And just so you can see, I'll turn up the fade as well. This is the effect we're creating. Just this star burst around all the bright areas of the image. And I can even turn down the threshold to something like 0.5, so it'll star even more. And then for the glare, I don't want any color modulation. Color modulation adds this the kind of rainbow effect. I don't want that. And turn down the mix to make this a lot less intense. And also the fade, just to make that decides the size of the star. Let's turn that down and turn down the mix until it's just barely visible. That's before and after. Looks good to me. And let's add another glare node. And this one will be ghosting. Ghosting, it does this. It just uh, reflects all the bright areas over on the other side of the image, uh, kind of mirroring it. If I turn up the quality to high and the iterations to max, that'll just add this colorization over the whole image. And we, for this one, we can add some color modulation as well, which creates some interest. And the threshold, I'll turn that down a little bit so we get even more of it. And then turn down the mix a lot. This one can break your image, but you'll see it adds this interesting kind of yellow flaring to my image. 
and I'll add just a little tiny bit, negative 0.96 in my case. That seems like it's, it's more than enough. And that concludes the lens effects. This is the lens emulation. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. I will give you something of a strange suggestion for a class. I've been learning pattern design on Skillshare. In Surface Pattern Design Key Principles for Making Outstanding Patterns, you'll learn what makes a cohesive pattern and what makes a good repeat. Are you seeing where I'm going? 3D artists work with tiling textures, but we rarely look to tile design to learn the craft, which is why a class that covers color, flow, arrangement, and proportion taught me things that 3D artists rarely learn. Skillshare is where creatives teach creatives, and they have their learning paths, where classes come together in a kind of playlist meant to give you comprehensive knowledge of a field. Like, for example, this, become a Surface Pattern Designer. The first 500 people to use my link in the description will receive a one-month free trial of Skillshare. Get started today. Now over to the second part, which will be the film emulation. The first thing we'll do, this is a bit of an advanced technique. I'm going to simulate halation, which is uh, a thing that film does where uh, around really bright parts you might get some discoloration, often red. And the way we'll do that is first we'll isolate the bright parts using a color ramp. I'll set this to B spline to make it a bit softer and just pull in the blacks. That'll give us just the right parts. And then I can multiply in a red value, turn off all the other channels to make it pure red. And we can decide here how red we want it. Not, not all halation is red, but, but a lot of it is. And I'll set it to 0.5 for now. And we can blur this image using the same kind of blur technique that we did earlier, using relative with aspect correction. Just blur it a little bit. Halation is very, very small around the highlights. And then we can add that back into the chain using an add. Let's view that and turn it down. Let's see, that's before and after, before and after. This is too big for me. Uh, I want it only on the highlights. Maybe I should set it to linear this time. No, because that does create that kind of harsh transition. I want B spline. I want to isolate just the very tips of the highlights. We can do that, multiply in a bunch of red, blur it, and then do this very subtly, just ever so slightly, a touch of it. That's off, on, off, on. Just add some redness to the highlights. Very slight, even slighter, 0.2. You shouldn't even be able to see it through YouTube. That's the test of whether I've restrained myself enough. Let's group this, call it halation, halation. That's a tricky one. Uh, shift right click to gather these into a reroute. The next step is a glare. And this one will be actual, th this will be bloom. So this is, I'll set it to fog glow, film bloom. Uh, the way uh, the way that, that strong parts uh, bleed over into other parts of the film. Let's do a high quality, and I want a low threshold on this. I want basically, I'll, I'll mix it so we see only that. Uh, I want most parts of the image to be glowing here. And that usually adds a bunch of weird coloring, which I really like. I, I like how it just picks up the color in the surfaces and just emphasizes it quite a lot. Let's turn up the size. We're, we want to soften the whole image. So now I can turn down the mix and just turn it up ever so slightly, just like that. So that's before and after. Before, after. It just adds a, a, um, an ambient haziness to the whole thing. And you can turn down the size if you want not that much haziness. Just keep it local around the lights. And honestly, I think 8 does work for me here in this exact case. And there's a, a big mistake that a lot of 3D artists do, and that is to show details in both like the brightest sky as well as in 
uh, the darkest like closet in the same image. And no sensor could see both of those in exposure range at the same time. And no film could either. And the way to simulate that inside Blender, there are, t there are two good ways. At this point in the compositing chain, I would add a color balance node because to me, this is, this is the most filmic uh, looking way to, to increase contrast. Uh, a photographer would have to choose, do I want a high key image or a low key image? So the difference is, do I want to expose to see details in the highlighted areas or do I want to expose to see the details in the shadows? And you can do both here. Uh, and the way you would do it is to change the lift, which is the shadows. And you might turn those down to clip them into black. And then you can bring down the highlights so you'll see more details there. And we can change the gain to just increase the midtones a bit. And we can increase the highlights a bit more, lower the shadows. And this would be a low key image. You would see um, details in the highlights. And you can do the opposite. We can turn up the highlights until those are super blown out and turn up the shadows until we see detail there and just pull down the gamma. And this is more like the opposite. So, so you, the, the bright parts are super overexposed and the dark parts are uh, in range. So you can see the details there. Another way to do this is to follow the professionals. And Troy Sabotka, who, who made the AGX transform inside Blender, here we can go to the Render tab under Color Management. And here I've, I have chosen just the base contrast for AGX. But if you go up, you, you have medium high contrast, you have high contrast, very high contrast. And this does basically the same thing, but probably more professionally than I just did with a color balance node. And you can change the exposure to be um, either low key or high key. So I, I enjoy this. And I'll use this instead of the color balance because I trust him more than I trust me. But this is the point you would add that node. Now let's do another kind of advanced thing. Let's make a high pass because I want to sharpen the image. But the, uh, the, the built-in filter, the sharpening filter, we have a box sharpen, which looks uh, pretty terrible. And we have a diamond sharpen, which looks slightly better, but I'm, I'm not uh, convinced. So let's make our own by doing a map range to convert it into a black and white image. And we want zero to one. So we need to clamp this, which just blows out the highlights in this. And then we can blur this image using the same technique as before, relative with aspect correction, and just turn that up. And then control shift right click to divide this out of the previous image. That is the way to make a high pass filter from scratch. And this we can overlay onto this. And you don't want to use soft light. You would typically use soft light in like Photoshop, but, but soft light usually doesn't work very well in Blender. I still need to clamp this divide node, but soft light still doesn't work. So I typically use overlay, which works a lot better. And overlay in this case um, adds that high pass filter onto our which is, which is a kind of, um, it's like a mid detail sharpening in this case. You, you choose how, how detailed it should be. Like if you make it real small, the blur, then you sharpen just like the edges. And so this kind of adds uh, the sharpening effect. It kind of removes, it adds local contrast is what it's called. But let's increase the size of this to a kind of mid detail and let's protect the highlights a bit using an inverted ramp so that in the highlights, this won't affect anything. And set that to B spline to make it a bit softer. Now the highlights are protected. Let's just mix that with a, a black. This is a la lazy man's factor. We'll do black, which is nothing, or we'll do white, which is a lot. And this is called local contrast. It's an overlay of a high pass. That's what this is. And we can do just a little bit of it. It adds, it adds some mid detail interest, but let's not overdo it. And I'll gather these in a reroute, control J to make a frame and call this high pass. And now this all taken together is our film emulation. And I'll go back over. If, if you feel like, like one obvious thing is missing, I'll probably get back to it at the end of the video. Just just wait for that.
But at the end, we'll do one more section, which is the grading section. The most important part of the grading section is the, um, the, um, the white balance. We need to balance the image. And white balance in the compositor is done by dividing out a color. So we'll set this to divide. And then we'll have to select a color from, from this window here that is... It's, it's supposed to be a neutral color, so you should have some white in your scene. If you don't, you can just add a cube. Like that. And you can sample a white color from this. Now this brightened the image a lot because this node shouldn't have any dark values in it. Like the value in HSV should be 1. But we can automate that so that you don't have to adjust that every single time you sample the image. And the way to do that is to do an RGB node. And uh, we, we sample using this instead. So I'll just copy this color into here. This is the one you use to sample. And from this, you can separate color, separate the HSV values, and you can recombine them in combine color, set to HSV also, and we combine, so here we just separate hue saturation value, and we combine in the hue and saturation, but the value will just be permanently one. We don't transfer that from the original color. And then let's use that inside the divide node. Control H, hide the sockets that we don't need, and make a nice looking column here. This will be white balance. And in this, it doesn't matter what value you choose because it ignores that value, right? So this is a white balance adjustment. It goes from a really like green-yellow image to a neutral image. And how much do we want that? How much do we want to keep the original color cast? Oh, maybe, we, maybe we just want to adjust a little bit in this case. I do like the original colors in the image. Now we can add a kind of contrast using this film-like curve here. The, the, this is a way that I really like to add contrast to an image, is to just pull this one up a lot on the filmic and pull down the gamma. Like this, to me, looks really good. And of course, you have to pull down the factor quite a lot. But like from, from this to this, it just... I think it adds a really nice looking contrast to the whole thing. Like that, that is really nice. If you do want to add more contrast, I might want a little bit of contrast in my image. Not, not a lot. And beware, this factor goes into the negatives. So from the middle, I want to pull this up a little bit. Then I like to have an exposure node, just so I have control of exposure at this point in the chain. And my image feels a little underexposed. Pull that up a little bit. And then at the very end, I add a color balance, which I use to add a kind of split tone. This is a very common practice in like Hollywood color grading and such, to add a little bit of teal into the shadows, which is the lift. I'm just barely nudging that. And then a little bit of warmth into the highlights just ever so slightly. So that's before and after. I can do I can do it a bit more extreme so that you can actually see it through the video compression. There. Before, after, before, after. It's uh some people love it. Some people think it's overused. I fall into both camps. So I'll pull down the factor a bit on that. 0.6 somewhere around that. And that concludes our grading section. Now I have in my default file not one secret sauce, but a couple of secret sauces. And those are these. These are a few custom nodes that I use that I really feel like elevate the image. I'll show you what they do. The bleach bypass node that goes at the start and at the end and it just adds this kind of desaturated contrast to the whole thing that I think is extremely good looking. It does something different at the start and at the end, so that's the start. 
But if you place it at a logical point in the grading pipeline, like at the end here, it just adds that rich, like really desaturated film look. And it's it's a little more complicated than what people usually do. People usually do a mixed color, and they just do a soft light over a, um, a, a ramped version of the image, like this. Or an overlay, I guess, do not break it. And I hope you can see, like, the difference between what I just did and this. That's not the right technique, what, what people usually do. This one, this is the color density node that goes at the film emulation stage. And the color density also just, it adds, a, first it adds a richness to all the colors and then it shifts everything towards a, a close primary color. This is before and this is after. So it adds this kind of density to that color and then shifts it towards its primary color. So actually I'll put this here and I'll put the bleach bypass node at the start. And then this is just a, a 16 millimeter grain file. That's, it's just an image file set to non-color that in the film emulation, you would just mix color you would set this to overlay and overlay a, a grain to it. But look at that, look at that nice looking texture to it. That's uh, before and after. Let's add a scale node here because that uh, is set to 69. And, and I know that this image is the four by three. And so if I just skip past everything else and view this, the grain doesn't fit. So I'll just have to scale that up. And there we go, that looks, that looks real lovely. And grain is not the same texture as render noise, guys. Render a clean image and then put over a, a grain node. And then this is, the, um, this is a sensor emulation. It's just a bunch of uh, specific curves that emulate uh, the RE sensor. And uh, what it usually does is, like mainly it desaturates blues. Like that's the, the most visual thing that it does. It desaturates blues, but it, it kind of emulates the Ari tones. I usually keep it muted in the chain so I can use it when I, when I really want to. And just look at what this density thing does to the blue. Like without density, with density. And so you can buy a pack of these custom nodes along with my default compositor for just like the price of a cup of coffee on my Gumroad and wonder was this whole video just a sales pitch to get you to buy those nodes? Yeah, but I hope it was a useful one. Oh, and if, if you want this compositor to be in your default file, when you open a new Blender, you just want this to be there, then you would go to Layout. You wouldn't have a bunch of objects here by default, obviously. You would go to File, Defaults, Save Startup File. And that gives you everything every time you open Blender.